Okay, so once again, welcome everyone to today's webinar on Servo Made Simple. Uh, we'll be talking about Unitronics Servo Solution. Uh, my name is Dan Logi. I manage the technical support department for Unitronics USA branch, and I'll be doing the presenting today. I'm going to start by presenting the solution, um, how Unitronics has implemented the Servo into their PLC platform. I'll talk a little bit about the advantages of the solution. I'll then go into a demonstration on software, how to program the units and how to integrate them into your project. I'll show a HMI screen with the servo solution uh, completed. And finally, I'll answer any questions that you guys might have on the solution. So feel free to enter your questions real time into the questions box. They'll be addressed at the end of the webinar, but just so that you don't forget them, go ahead and enter them real time. They will be addressed. So to begin, um, when Unitronics was implementing the servo solution, um, they thought about common servo challenges that users face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a lot of the challenges focused around knowledge, right? Knowledge of system design of servo solutions, specifically configuration and tuning, integration of the servo to the PLC and to the HMI, the logic development, the HMI design, the electrical design. There are a lot of tools required or knowledge required to implement um, a fully functional servo solution. And to the right there, you can see some of the, the, the skill sets that one might need to have, mechanical, electrical, controls, background, system integration. So throughout the implementation, Unitronics R&D kept these challenges in mind and really tried to streamline um, you know, the integration in the ease of use for the solution. And that was our main question to ourselves when we were developing, can we simplify? So for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, Unitronics Heart is a PLC and a HMI solution. Okay, it's a all-in-one integrated solution. One software package for the HMI, the PLC, the IO, and now the VFD and the AC servo motors. So here's a nice little integration chart. You can see the Unistream PLC focused in the middle. To the left, you can see some uh, IT solutions, right, like PCs, HMIs. Uh, you can get out to the web via SQL, MQTT, emailing, and more. And then on the bottom right, you see all the field tech, right, the I.O., the Ethernet I.O., the VFD. And the focus point of today's presentation, the servo system, right? EtherCAT is a somewhat new addition to the servo system. Uh, it is supported on the Unistream PLC only, so the USC models. And you can add an HMI to any USC model in the form of a Unistream light panel. So it's still a all-in-one solution, Unistream PLC, HMI, and then the servo solution. Can open is also supported from the PLC to the servo system. And that's supported on the Unistream PLC, the Unistream modular, the Unistream built-in, and the Vision series. So if uh, EtherCAT is desired, the Unistream PLC only, uh, or the USC models, is gonna be the recommendation. Um, and if can open is desired, um, any Unistream or Vision product line will support that offering. And again, we're talking about the communication from the PLC to the servo system. All right, so we're going to talk about simplification. Um, there's a lot of talk about simplification in motion control, right? Um, everybody claims their solution is easy, effective, and, you know, uh, one of the best offerings on the market. So, 
what I'm going to focus on in the next few minutes before the demonstration is how Unitronics went about simplification um, and the main differences between us and uh, some of the other offerings. So Unitronics offers a all-in-one software package to program the HMI, the PLC, the I.O., the VFD, and now the servo systems. Okay, everything's in one. It's called UniLogic for the Unistream controller or VisiLogic for Vision. With other offerings, um, competitive offerings, right, you need several software packages, right? You might need a software package to program the HMI, the PLC, the VFD, the servo. Um, I myself have integrated a couple third-party servo solutions, right? And you usually need their software package uh, to do some troubleshooting, some initial setup. Um, so, so usually the software is not built in. But with Unitronics it is, right? You're downloading one software package and doing all your programming there. Next, the integration between the PLC and the servo, right? With third-party servos, you'll usually have a manual, and there will be a protocol, and you need to map all of the servo functionality, right? Whether it be parameter settings, um, run commands, stop commands, homing commands. Um, and, you know, this can be somewhat simple with a simplified product, right? But, but usually it takes time to integrate, right? And the more complex your offering, right, the more features that you're going to add, the larger um, the task is going to be to integrate those, right? The more integration it's going to take. With Unitronics, the servo is a drag-and-drop offering, much like I.O., right? You're going to be able to select your servo drive, select your motor, the communication is automatic, right? There's no mapping. There's no uh, struggling with integration, right? We like to call it hassle-free, right? It's, it's plug and play, drag and drop. And to the left here, you can see some of the commands for third-party servos, right? You need to build these commands. And again, sometimes it's a protocol, common protocol that's supported. Um, but either way, you're, you're integrating there. And to the right, the integration's already done, and you just execute a function block offered inside UniLogic to initiate the command to the servo. Uh, really quick, someone did ask if this webinar will be available afterwards. Uh, it will be. We will make this, this webinar available. So uh, we'll send that out shortly after the presentation. OK, next. Um, function blocks, and, and mainly the ease of use of Unitronics function blocks. So to the left, you can see a well-known uh, software package here for PLC programming, and this is their interface, the competitor's interface, to their servo solution. Okay. In the software, you need to define a folder for the servo, a folder for movement, and a folder for each command, right? And once you go to use the command, there are a lot of necessary uh, elements that you need to add to it. Okay. To the right, you'll see a Unitronics function block, right? And the red empties, the spaces for the red empty, are the required parameters. And you can see there's only four uh, in a move relative function block, right, that are uh, dynamic and required. And we're going to go over this when we open the software. And we'll take a look at what each one of those parameters are. Um, but we give you more flexibility as far as what you need to define, uh, what you need to change from the defaults, and more. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in the function blocks when we open the software. Next is the mechanical side of the system. A lot of times um, with servo, systems and machines, uh, the mechanical engineer needs to work very closely with the controls engineer, right, to convey what's in the system, uh, what units equate to what motor revolutions, right, there's a lot of calculations that need to be done to make sure that you're moving at the appropriate position, the appropriate speed, 
or maybe applying the appropriate torque, right? And you know, there's a lot of checking, double checking, uh, and a lot of math that goes into it. With Unitronic solution, the axis, and when I say axis, the, the mechanical properties of the system can be defined within the software. You see a picture here to the right. You can define actuators and reducers right in the software. And what that's going to do is it's going to take the motor resolution, right? Either it's pulses per second or maybe uh, individual motor counts, right? And it's going to convert them to engineering units of the system. So here you'll see uh, the linear actuator is the endpoint of the mechanical system. So maybe it's linear millimeters, right? So instead of working with motor units, you'll be working with millimeters of the linear actuator right in your project. There will be no external calculations that are needed. Everything's in the software. Okay, next, um, diagnostic tools that are built into the software. So first, we do have a motion diagnostic page. If you have any errors with your movements um, or your setup, um, they'll be listed here in the motor diagnostics. You can run the diagnostics and figure out uh, what errors are present. Next programming the servo from the software. We have something called a configuration for the servo drives. Here you're going to be able to see the default parameters of the servo drive and you'll be able to change those parameters from the UniLogic software. Those can then be communicated to the drive at power up ensuring that the drive has the correct parameters, okay? If you swap out a drive with a new drive, those parameters are still going to be communicated to the new drive um, when you call for it, say at power up, or maybe it's a button on screen. But regardless of the drive you're using, um, you can always communicate those parameters downstream to the drive from the PLC. So replacing units, um, or, or adding additional servo systems is very easy because you already have that configuration built. You already have the parameters that you want the servo drive to have in the PLC. They just need to be communicated to the new drive. We also have uh, options um, to see what parameters were modified from the defaults, right? So it will compare the current value to the default and it will just show you the modified parameters. Next, within UniLogic we do have a diagnostic tool, uh, a scope built in, and you can plot different aspects of the servo uh, system, right, particularly the moves. So here in red you can see the position demand value, and in the green, you can see the velocity actual value, right? And you can change the values that you're plotting. So in this next chart here, you can see it's velocity actual in red and torque actual in green. You can zoom in. Um, you can investigate a particular uh, sequence that you need to investigate, see how the motor's reacting, if it's tuned well and more. Last chart here that we're demoing, you can see the target position in red and then the following error in green. So there's a lot of options here to graph and investigate uh, certain aspects of, of the move. Uh, the last point that I'm going to discuss are built-in predefined HMI screens that you can enable with your servo system. So not only is the integration uh, automatic, right, you'll also have a canned set of HMI screens where you can execute moves immediately, right, out of the box with your first program. 
and it's very helpful to get your moves down. Okay, so here you can see five tabs at the top and some statuses at the bottom. Okay, first on the general tab, you're going to be able to program certain parameters of the servo, like your I.O. points, your limits, software limits for positive and negative, um, and any back-end parameters of the servo. You'll be able to select an access and program it here from this general tab. The next tab over will be motion. Here you can test moves out of the box, right? You can do a velocity move, a jog move, a position, or a torque move, or a torque command, right? And within those options, you can set different uh, movement styles. So for here, as an example, uh, we have a position move, and it's a cyclical bi-directional move. So you have profile A, profile B. You can set the position for each move, the velocity, acceleration, deceleration, jerk factor. And you can also enter the number of cycles in the middle. You can click on Run, and the motor will move according to Profile A, which will finish, then Profile B, which will finish, and it will repeat for the number of cycles set. You can see your position, velocity, and torque all changing at the bottom of the software, and you'll actually be able to see the motor move. Next tab over, homing. You can select your homing method, some of the parameters of the home, and click on the run button and the home will execute. Next tab over, tuning the motor. We have simple tuning and manual tuning. Simple tuning will essentially be one parameter tuning right, the servo gain. And then manual tuning will give you access to um, a few more options to be more precise with your tuning. Finally, the trend tab at the top will allow you to trend certain aspects of your move, everything from position to torque to velocity. And you can see it in nice graphical format here. You can inspect it. And it's kind of a light version of what's available in UniLogic itself. It's a little bit more basic than that, um, but it is available directly on the HMI, which is a huge benefit. And one thing I didn't mention, uh, right below the trend to the left will be the command keys, right? So the green um, power button will be the enable, disable. Just to the right of that, the circle will be the reset. And then you'll have a pause command and a halt command. So again, those are the hot keys for control. So at this point, I'm going to jump to the software and show you how uh, the servo is implemented and how to program. This is UniLogic here. It's used to program our UniStream controllers. I'm going to start a new project. I'm going to call this project USC Servo Demo. And I'll click on Next. It's going to ask me to define the Unitronics PLC that's being used. Is it a modular Unistream, a built-in, or a standalone PLC? And then which model are you working with? I'll go with a Pro and a B1. And again, that was just the selection for the PLC, which again is the heart of the system. The program will begin. You'll see the PLC in the middle. And again, this is a, a PLC only model, and you can add a screen to it. But we also have other models like the built-in and the modular that come standard with an HMI. But this would have an external HMI via a Ethernet cable.
could also be a small, uh, smartphone or a tablet to view the HMI as well. So to the left, under hardware configuration, I'll navigate to UniIO and UniCom. And first, I need to define the communication channel the servo will be communicating over. I can add a CAN bus card or a EtherCAT card. And for this demo, I'll go ahead and add the EtherCAT card, and we see it's placed to the right. The CAN bus card would go to the left. Once I add the communication cards required for the servo system, under hardware configuration, navigate to motion drives, servo, servo drives. There are two lines of drives, the CAN bus offering, CAN open offering, and the EtherCAT offering. I'll select an EtherCAT drive. In the bottom right, the properties window, I'll select the motor series that I'm working with and the specific motor. I'll select a 0.1 kilowatt motor here. And some of the properties will import. We can see this as a 23-bit absolute encoder. Torque limitations, current limitations are all set here for your reference. I'll go ahead and add one more just so we can define two axes and show you that uh, we're not limited to just one. I'll again choose my motor series and the specific motor that's connected to the drive. Now next, I'd like to show you a configuration. Uh, configuration is optional, right? So often, servo parameters will work great as the defaults, right? Adding a configuration is optional, and you can change the parameters from the configuration. So I'll add one configuration here for an EtherCAT drive. I'll click on the configuration, and here I'll have my servo parameters in groups. As an example, group one is the parameters of servo gain, and here are my specific parameters in table format of that group. I'll see the function code, the name, the default value, in the fifth column over, or sixth column over, and then the configured value, which is the value that I can change. And I can go to any one of these groups and change the configured value. Now the fast configuration here are the parameters our team thought were most uh, touched, right, most changed. Uh, and these include things like stop mode, the servo gain, the positioning error, maybe I want a larger positioning error here, right? Maybe I want um, my direction to be clockwise, right? And I can make the changes in the configured value column. Once I make a change, the parameter is added to my modified parameters section for easy reference. Again, these are strictly optional. You have other options as well, right? You can use the defaults. You can program the servo from its own interface uh, and more. So optional to program the servo parameters from the software. And again, this is passed to the PLC at download. The PLC will be the one that passes this configuration file to the servo. Next, under the Solution Explorer, Motion, axes. I'll add a new axis. Here it's going to ask if you would like to import the default HMI screens that I talked about in the presentation. This had the five tabs at the top, right? Um, I'll pull up actually my screen here. 
If you choose to import that functionality, you'll have these screens built into your project. And here is a little video on how to uh, implement and use the screens. And you have the option to import now or skip for now. And you can always import them later. I'll go ahead and skip for now. For this axis, I need to link a drive. We have defined two. I'll link drive one to axis one. And I will enter the axis. Now here you have your motor, right? Your Unitronics motor that we have already defined. I'll add a rotary actuator to the mechanics of the system. Okay, and the, the uh, rotary actuator is added to the motor. In the bottom right, I'm going to define the properties of the rotary actuator. So let's say I would like to work in 0 0.1 degree. Okay. The max torque can be set, uh, maybe 5 newton meters. You can change from newton meters to pounds force, or pounds inch, excuse me. Um, then back to newton meters. You can define the efficiency of the actuator. And finally, the max speed on the input side. So let's say this is uh, 50,000 units per second. And again, these properties are specific to the actuator. I'll go ahead and scroll down. And here are options to uh, be defined of this axis. For example, the stopping options or the motion options like acceleration and deceleration, trapezoidal versus S-curve. If I scroll down further, I can see my positioning options like maximum positioning error maximum positioning time. Next, the velocity options. Let's bump this up. And uh, I'll enter a value of 1 million degrees per second, or 0 0.1 degrees per second, excuse me. And I'll see it turn red, right? Why is it red? I can hover over, and it'll tell me. Um, the mechanical limit is 50,000. Right, I define that on the rotary actuator limitation of 50,000. Right, and then it gives me a comment saying the motor can exceed that, uh, the peak velocity of the motor, and that can be 360,000 units per second. Right, so I'll go ahead and change this to 360,000, and I see it turns yellow. If I hover over again. It'll tell me, yes, the motor can accomplish this, right? The motor has no problem moving at this speed. Uh, the issue is with the mechanics, right? The actuator, again, that I defined, cannot move at this speed. So it'll let you define that speed as maximum. It'll just give you a warning, right? Your actuator limit is, is less than that. You can define the torque. positive and negative limits, right? And then finally, the default homing method. So all these things are defined on the axis. And again, the calculation from motor pulses to 0.1 degrees is done for the user, for the programmer automatically. They will now be programming in 0.1 degree of the rotary actuator. So this asset access configuration is super useful um, to link that disconnect from the controls engineer and the mechanical engineer, right? I'll go ahead and add one more axis. We'll make it a little bit more complicated. I'll link drive two this time. I'll enter the axis. I'll define a pulley. In the bottom right, I will define the pulley uh, limitations. Maybe inner diameter is 35 and outer diameter is 98. 
right? You can change the Mac torque, Mac speed, and so on. And off of that, I'll add a rack and pinion. Define the pitch pinion diameter, maybe 83, something like that. And again, the max torque, the efficiency, the max speed, all can be set according to the specs of this mechanical uh, property, right, or this mechanical element. Again, the math is done for the user. They're now working um, with the opinion engineering units as opposed to the motor engineering units. And I want to stress that this is not necessary, right? You could just work with motor units if that's what you prefer, uh, but this is a very nice tool uh, to help bridge that gap. Okay, next, now that we have our axes defined, I'm going to jump to the ladder. I'll show you where the ladder function blocks are in the toolbox. Navigate to motion control. And these are the function blocks to control the servo. First, MC power. This will be the enable. Okay, you drop it down. If you hover over the A parameter, it'll give you information about what it's looking for. This is the axis that it's referring to. Remember, we define two axes, right? Which axis? And then an enable bit for this axis. So I'll link axis one. Enable bit, I don't have one yet, so I'll click the pencil icon and call this axis one underscore enable. And it's going to be a bit on or off. It's either enabled or it's not. Up here, the red empty, this is going to be a struct for the statuses of the power block. So I'll go ahead and link uh, axis one underscore MC power. Okay. And I can see the struct was created. Inside of it, I have a status, whether or not it was valid, an error, an ID error, and the status of the enable or disable of the access, right? So that's just feedback in the form of a struct. So to enable this access, you just set this bit, okay, the access will be enabled. Let's take a look at a move, maybe a move relative. I'll place that down. Same concept, right? Hover over the A parameter. It's looking for which access this block is, is referencing. We'll link access one. The B is the execute for the command. I'll link a bit, right? And I'll say axis one move relative. And when I want to execute the move relative, turn this bit on. The rising edge will execute the move. The C parameter is a continuous update. If the position changes during the move, should I update the move parameters or should I keep the initial move command? So you can put that to a one to continuous update. The D is the distance. How far are we moving? Well, if I want to move two revolutions, 7,200, right, is 3,600 times two, right? Again, we're, we're working in 0.1 degree of the rotary actuator. So 7,200 will be a two revolution move of the actuator. You could also link this to a tag, make the distance dynamic. The E parameter is velocity, at what speed are we moving, F acceleration, G deceleration, and finally the jerk factor, which is relevant for S curve moves only. And again at the top here we'll link a status struct I'll call this axis one underscore MC underscore MR underscore status. 
And again, that will give us some feedback on the move. Now notice here I'm putting these function blocks directly on the power rail. Uh, that's how it should be. They should run all the time. And they're referencing their own enable bits, or their trigger bits, to execute or not execute the command. So no need for conditions in front of the blocks. Uh, we'll do one more, uh, maybe an apply force function block, which is pretty unique to Unitronics. Um, and an apply torque function block will apply a set amount of torque from the motor, right? The motor torque is what it's referencing. An apply force function blocks takes into account the mechanics of the system and it will calculate the force for the user. So if, if the user knows the amount of force they would like to apply from the mechanics to you know, the load, um, they can just use this function block. Again, the math will be done for them. Let's look at the properties, the A parameter, what access, right? Access one. The B parameter is the execute, right? So this starts to get a little familiar, right? Everything is in the same spot on each function block. So I'll call this access1 underscore apply force. The C, continuous update. Would we like to update if the force is updated? By default, that's a 1. Yes, we would. D is the force. How much force would we like? And again, I think we had five Newton meters as the max, so I can put in maybe three Newton meters, what we'd like to apply. Uh, the force ramp. And finally, the direction. So, um, last thing, the status. Put this axis one. MC underscore apply force underscore status. Okay. And you build out, build out your program with whatever function blocks you require. There's a move velocity, there's a move absolute, a move additive, and then there's halting, stopping, and homing function blocks as well. We have resets, jog, down below. So that's how you program. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to demonstrate a controller that is hooked up on my desk. It's been pre-programmed. These are the diagnostic screens, right? The built-in HMI displays that I've enabled for that axis. Under general, first choose the axis you're referencing, right? This is referencing axis one. I can then configure limits, do some access configuration, or access the parameters within the drive. I'll take a look at the limits here. We can enable software limits for positive and negative. We can enable and disable pot not here as well, positive over travel and negative over travel limits. Take a look at drive configuration quickly here. You can choose the group and the parameter number, and you can send a new value to that specific parameter on the drive. At the top, I'll navigate to motion. Here are the four built-in uh, motion commands that you can use to demo. First, we have jog, a velocity move, a torque move, and finally a position move. If I enter position move, we'll have profile A and profile B like we talked about in the, um, in the PowerPoint. At the bottom here, I can see the status of the drive. Right now it's connected, there are no errors on the drive, and the state is currently disabled. I can enable here, and I see the motor is currently at a standstill. It's a horizontal application, so there's no torque, right? It's just laying on a desk. Velocity is zero, and the position 
is currently high, right? This is from um, a residual move. So before I execute this bi-directional move, I'm going to execute a home. I'll navigate to the home. I'll use command number 35, which means set the current position to the home. I'll go ahead and run the command, and I see the position instead of 3,600,000, right? It now goes to zero. And I'll navigate back to motion, and I'll execute my bi-directional move. And I see the torque, the velocity, and the position update. The motor goes through the, uh, the motor spins to 40,000. That's what I have set. And then turns around and moves back to zero, or minus 40,000. And it does this for a total of two cycles, which is what I have set. I can increase the number of cycles and run it again. And it will sit there and oscillate uh, between the two profiles until the cycles are complete. Tuning. We have our simple and our manual tuning. Simple just as the servo gain and a rigid, uh, rigidity setting. Here under manual tuning, you have more control, right? You have the velocity loop gain, the integral time, as well as the position loop gain. Okay, most of the time, uh, simple tuning is going to work just fine for, for the majority of systems. Um, we I have encountered systems that, that do need the manual tuning, but those are more advanced. For, for good results, uh, simple tuning does, does work well. Okay, so that concludes my demo. Okay, that concludes my demo. So at this point, uh, I'd like to open up to any questions uh, that anybody has. You can enter them into the question box now.